It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 33, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Eat Well Farm in California's Sacramento Valley, just over an hour from San Francisco, is 105 acres of deep, flat, fertile ground. There, my guest, Nigel Walker, conducts a symphony of employees, cover crops, lavender, chickens, vegetables, fruits, and herbs to provide for a CSA of 550 shares a week, as well as the Ferry Plaza Farmer's Market. Nigel describes his systems for training and delegating to employees to create pride in their work and profits for the business. And we dig deep on the cover crop and chicken management system on his farm that allows him to grow vegetables year round without fertilizer or pesticides. I really enjoyed this episode. It really stretched my thinking about quite a number of things. I think you're going to enjoy it too. Thanks for joining us. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmigo CSA management software, providing the tools you need to manage your CSA business. Farmigo CSA management software has a customizable management system to meet your farm's specific needs. CSA management software.com. Nigel Walker, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you very much. So glad you could join us this evening. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Nigel, could you tell us a little bit about Eat Well Farm there in Dixon, California? And, and uh, you know, how many acres are you farming? What kinds of enterprises are you doing? How are you selling your products? Yeah, that's fine. I'm, uh, I've am i been here since 1993. We're in the Sacramento Valley, uh, about 20 miles um, west of Sacramento and about 70 miles um northeast of San Francisco. So it's a, it's a great location. We're three miles from I-80. Uh, we can be in San Francisco in about an hour with the wind behind. So it's a great location for a farm serving our customers. Now, when, when you say that you're in the Sacramento Valley, is that what, what we here in the Midwest would think of as the big evil Central Valley? Or are you kind of separate from that? No, we're 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 in the evil part. We're definitely in the evil part. I mean, uh, well, one little story actually. When uh, when I was looking to buy this farm, I uh, I looked at this farm and said, "This is the place." And I I actually got some good friends of mine who are local farmers to come and look at it to make sure I wasn't doing anything stupid. And, <laughs> And I said, you know, I said, look at this. So they came on the farm and they sort of sort of kicked the dirt around and picked it up and, you know, sort of rubbed a little bit in their, in their palm and sort of didn't say anything for about five, ten minutes and tasted the soil and said, uh, so, so, so what do you think? Am I, you know, am I being stupid or something? And they said, they said, this is boy's soil. I said, what do you mean? They said, you don't have to be a man to farm this soil. So uh, <laughs> So it's flat. Um, um, it, I, it was chosen by me because we have a reliable water supply. Um, you know, I really wanted a piece in this area because it had a reliable water supply. Like we haven't had no restrictions so far with the drought. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. The reservoir that supplies the canal that runs in front of this uh, um, uh, has three years supply in it. So it's unlike many reservoirs in California, which are really primarily um, flood control. And so, you know, they, they have to keep a lot of space uh, in uh, the reservoir for floods for the next winter. Well, uh, you know, we keep, we've got three years supply. So, I mean, we've had no restrictions. And in the 50 years of uh, this dam's operation, there's only been one year when they were cut back. So, you know, last time I checked, I told, told somebody re- recently, last time I checked, vegetables needed water to grow. So, uh, you know, that was why it was, we paid, I p- paid a lot of money for this farm uh, at the time. Um, and uh, because, you know, as a, I'm, 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 I, I, my only source of income is farming. So my, li- my livelihood depends on it. Absolutely. A hundred percent. We have no other source of income. So, you know, I got to get the right stuff. You know, you, you, I mean, and I know people farm on some very difficult soils and in very difficult situations, uh, for many different circumstances, but you know, I had the opportunity to buy a piece of prime farmland. So I took it. You know, I, I have a friend who farms here in Wisconsin who started off farming in the hills of southwest Wisconsin and moved several years ago to an area more more up in the central sands, which is flatter 
just a lot flatter ground, easier farming than the, than the heavy clay soils down around the Viroqua area. And she said to me, Chris, I didn't know I was such a good farmer. <laughs> you know? well, and I, I think it goes yeah. right to what you said about a boy's it's boy soil. You know, you, you, why make it harder on yourself than you have to? Well, you put the same effort into a crop, honestly. I mean, you're planting, you're, you're cultivating, or you're doing everything to the crop that's the same. And, and you really have to find the best piece of soil you could, that you can possibly afford in the area where you decide to live because then that will determine what you get out of the soil, what your yield is. Um, and, uh, you know, well, I want, you know, I've got, my kids are at college and uh, I've got mortgages to pay and things like that. So I want to want to use the best tools possible. Now you've got a pretty sizable operation. I mean, not obviously the, the sort of uh, demonized California mega farm um, that we're used that we like to bash out here, but, but uh, 105 acres of organic ground there. Yeah, there's 65 that I pay a mortgage on and 40 that I lease from a local family. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, but, you know, the, the guy who runs a canal refers to this as my garden, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just this irritating little blot on the landscape for most of the local farmers, you know? Are, you, are there many organic farmers in your area? Well, yeah, it's, it actually is an interesting fact that uh, a lot of organic walnuts are produced in this area. Like the farm to the south of me uh, is, uh, I mean, I, I don't, really don't know how many acres, but it's got to be uh, 300 acres. Uh, that is all uh, certified organic walnut. And uh, that's our southern boundary. Uh, a lot of the, organ- lot of the uh, walnut farmers see the sense in farming the walnuts organic, um, purely financially, but you know, even some of the chemicals pretty nasty you have to use on walnuts if they can get a good enough price uh, for the organic walnuts to make up with any difference in yield, then they're, they're on it, you know? And you've got vegetables and chickens on that 105 acres, right? Yeah, well, the, the way the farm works is that right from the beginning, we really wanted to do a CSA, the Community Supported Agriculture. And so... That's how we've designed the farm. Um, you know, we've got uh, seven and a half acres of fruit trees, which are, you know, I mean, I've got uh, 14 varieties of peaches, 15 varieties of nectarines. I've got, you know, all different kinds of citrus and uh, uh, cherries and plums and apricots and apriums. Uh, you know, all designed so that, you know, they they can produce over a longer period if possible to make our boxes as interesting as possible. So fruits, we do herbs, we do vegetables. We even have been growing a small amount of wheat to produce flour. Uh, chickens are very much a part of the fertility of the farm, but obviously the eggs are welcome. So we're pretty diverse in that respect, yes. That kind of diversity, I mean, something that's not even possible here in the upper Midwest, is that standard in your area for CSA farms, or have you kind of taken that to a different level? Um, well, when I look at the local farms, uh, we've got Full Belly, we've got River Dog Farm, we've got T- Terra Firma. They're all pretty, they're much larger, they're much larger than I am, but they are still pretty diverse too. They'll have a wholesale component, they'll have a, uh, a CSA component to their farms, and they do, some of them do farmers markets. And uh, yeah, they're, I mean, like a farm like Full Belly is very diverse as well. So we're not that unusual. Um, but, you know, that's four or five farms in a, in a huge area. So, uh, you know, on our block, you know, within the 50 miles. Um, so as the organic farmers go, uh, the mature ones, we're, we're not that unusual. And are you marketing all of your produce through the CSA? No. Um, I would say at the moment, it's about 65, 70% goes through the CSA. Um, we do one farmer's market at the Berry Plaza Farmer's Market in San Francisco on a Saturday. That's about 15% of our business. Uh, we work with an online uh, retailer called Good Eggs. Um, and then we do a little bit of shipping uh, online because uh, one of my sort of hobbies that got out of control was lavender. So we have uh, we have three acres of lavender that we uh, cut, dry, sell fresh, and we just distill it and that kind of stuff. 
one of the things that really struck me as I was learning about your farm was how many different enterprises you're doing. I mean, you've got the vegetables, you've got the fruit, you've got the eggs. You've also got a line of herbal salts and a line of sodas. Yeah. Well, the thing is about all the different enterprises, they've oftentimes come at the suggestion of our members. So take the salt, for example. Um, you know, I was I grow lavender, and then I had a customer in San Francisco oh, in the late eight nineties who said to me, "Hey, Nigel, I just come back from holiday in Provence, and we were served a steak with lavender salt." And of course, I try I try and pride myself in paying attention, <laughs> you know. Um, and I said, <laughs> "Oh, let me try that." So I I got some salt and I got some dried lavender and put it on the steak and go, "Ooh, that's actually quite good." So my next step was to buy all these different salts and grind them up with sort of different concentrations of lavender and um, hand them out to sort of chefy kind of people at the farmer's market in jars. And, you know, so which one did you like? And of course, unfortunately, they all came back liking the most expensive salts. Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's that kind of how that was born. And, um, and you know, the thing is that there's one uh, lady... Uh, who really just takes care of that side of the business for me. I mean, she makes the salt, she, she manages, we have a, we have a, a warehouse facility and a certified kitchen in the town of Dixon. Um, and so she, she makes, she takes care of that. And she tells me, you know, when she's got a problem or when she needs something, I mean, I'm not standing over her, I'm not making the salt. And it goes the same for the uh, eggs, too. I mean, uh, Augustine's been with me for oh, 10, 11 years. Uh, he runs the chickens. And while we've had a, a lot of interaction this year because we've got a new uh, project with the, our dual-purpose heritage breeds, but normally the chicken operation, he runs that. And he'll say, hey, you know, I need, I've got a problem. Or I'll say, uh, you know, I just noticed something. So, you know, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day running. So I'm, I'm very much um, uh, not a micromanager. I'd, li I'd like to think that I can train these people to do their job, make sure, you know, they can do it and they're capable and they're fully trained, and then basically get out of their hair. And uh, it really does seem to work. And uh, they really, you know, they run with it. Or not, as the case may be, but uh, when you find the right people, um, they take a lot of pride in their work, and it's really wonderful to see. It's always easy to manage people when you find the right people. How do you deal with it when you when you bring somebody into an enterprise at a, at a higher level and and it doesn't work out when they don't take it and run with it? Uh, well, it depends. How, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm not afraid of uh, letting people go. I mean, I had to fire somebody yesterday, actually. Um, you know, the thing is, is that I see my job here as a responsibility for the livelihoods of 17, 18 people that work here. And it's a serious business, you know. Uh, they, their kids need shoes. They've got mortgages to pay. And we all need to work as a team. And so if there's, there's two things, like somebody may be not doing a good job because I didn't, and most of the time, here's the answer, most of the time they're not doing a good job because I didn't train them properly. Most of the time it is my fault. You know, okay, ah, I really didn't, I uh, didn't explain that. I didn't uh, help them with that, uh, you know, in the right situation. That's a little bit difficult, different to what I, we talked about. And we, we can rectify that. So I find that, you know, right. that, that's really where, where, it, where it comes down to is making sure that you find the right people, helping them, guiding them, and gradually letting go of the reins. I like Because well, it really is what you have to do to be able to, to do something as big as what you're doing there at Eat Well. I think it's impossible. I mean, uh, I've had some health issues the last four or five years, and quite frankly, um, farm has done, you know, remarkably well considering, I mean, uh, I actually had the, uh, ag commissioner come out and they, they inspect the farm for the producer certificate every year. And I walked around, I, I, I'd been off the farm for a few months and, um, walked around the farm and the, um, and the ag commissioner said, Nigel, the farm's looking much better than normal. 
<laughs> and I said, well, that's, that's probably because I haven't been here. <laughs> and of course, Jose, my foreman, uh, who's been with us 17 years, he just lapped, he just, he just lapped that one up, you know, it was, uh, that was a great story. And, uh, that was, uh, that was a great compliment to the wonderful people that work here. Well, and to the, I think the systems that you've must have put in place as, as the owner and the manager there over the years. I mean, that's, I think that's something that goes both ways. Oh, uh, I mean, I take, uh, I, I, I would say the thing that I'm most proud of here is the people that work here um, and the way they do their jobs. I mean, please, um, this is not perfect. When you walk on the farm, but all I can see is things that are not right that need to be done. But um, when I see people really taking pride in their work, um, I'm, it, it gives me a thrill, you know, and when you empower people, I mean, there are, you know, there is, unfortunately in farming, you know, with the competition that we face from organic produce coming up from, uh, uh, corporate farms in Mexico and all over the place, it's a pretty tight game. It really is very tight. And, and, you know, you, I can't pay these people enough. I honestly can't. But one way, you, what you can do is give them pride in their job, you know, and leave them alone to do their job. And um, and satisfaction and in a, in a job is a, is a great reward. Um, yes, we have to pay our bills. I understand that. But but when somebody leaves you alone, you feel as though you know what you're doing. It's a great great thing. Is your family involved in the farming operation as well? Well, my, my wife, Lorraine, is very much involved in the, fam- in the farm. I mean, uh, she gets tours of the farm and uh, she does the books. She keeps us on the financial track. She does farmer's markets. She's one of our relief drivers as well. She drives the same time I do if somebody's sick or uh, we need somebody else to drive. There's a lot of things that, um, that Lorraine does that uh, don't necessarily get recognized. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, it goes for a lot of farmers out there, you know, behind every... You know, if you see there's a great farmer out there, there's an even greater woman behind that farmer. Um, I mean, USDA talks about, uh, you know, how few women are in farming. I, I would dispute that. I would say, you know, there's a, uh, those farmers, those guys that are signing those census forms and uh, filling out those tax returns, there's an uh, a equally great woman who is uh, very much a part of that business. And so, um, you know, we all have all, uh, we play different roles. and. Um, uh, men, women do very different things on farms, but uh, I think their their role is very much <clears throat> underappreciated by the uh, the powers that be. Uh, I certainly appreciate all the work that my wife Lorraine does. Yeah, I think that's almost universally true. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think it's a it is a it's a pretty common theme that we've had on the podcast. Yeah, well, you know, bouncing ideas. I mean, Lorraine did um, uh, a, a one week class uh, with uh, Elaine Ingham. You know, studied soil science with her uh, this spring. I wasn't able to do it, and she said, "Well, I want to do it. I'm interested in this because she makes natural sodas, lacto fermented sodas. So she knows a lot about this stuff already. So she went and did this class, and uh, she got a lot more out of it than I would. I think, and uh, it's been fantastic fantastic to sit down and talk about how we're going to um, make improvements to our system. Uh, you know, we bought a microscope and we're going to assay our, our soils this winter. And, um, you know, then we're going to start doing compost teas and see where we make improvements and different situations, different crops. So, um, you know, uh, she's very technically involved in the farm as well as keeping us on the straight and narrow. You told me a story earlier in the week about having another inspector come to your farm from CCLF, your your local certification agency, and and not understanding your input inventory form, um, and that there was there just wasn't much on it. No, that's, that's. I mean, my wife Lorraine and I we have made some great changes over the last six or seven years, and and really from observation, I mean. Um, uh, I have, uh, you know, I was trained, I did a, a vocational degree in England in commercial horticulture, specializing in vegetable crop production. I've always been on that organic bent, uh, much to my tutor's uh, chagrin. Um, 
But, you know, I would buy the compost from the dairy farms or the chicken places and put that on my fields and I'd buy the pelletized chicken manure and buy the, you know, the seabird guano and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, this isn't, I'm bringing all this fertility from the farm and onto the farm from places I'm relying on the fertility the farm's relying on these, all these things that I really don't like and I detest. And so, you know, over the years, I've been trying to get away from that. So in 2000, we went to using uh, compost made with food waste from San Francisco. Fortunately for us, it was not too far away that it's made. So the transportation was not horrendous. So that's when we switched there. And then, you know, over the years, I've been experimenting with cover crops and um, uh, gradually got into this system of where I am. Uh, grow one year of a very diverse cover crop. We run the chickens over that. We uh, pasture the chickens over it. And then if we've got some sheep at the time, they graze it. Or if not, we mow it every time it gets to the uh, maturity level, which here can be seven, eight or nine times a year. And in that way, right. right and in that way, <clears throat> after all that fertility, the chickens go in, uh, like in a mob stocking operation, and they just eat this stuff down to the ground and poop all over it. And then we cultivate it up and we plant two years of solid vegetables. I mean, here that means uh, three crops a year, non stop for two years, no rotations, and uh, you know, no. You know, no absolute set rotations. I refer to it as the uh, the chaos theory. But just keep planting. Obviously, we're not going to plant cabbages after cabbages, and then back right. then back to um, back to um, uh, one year of pasture. So we've done that a few times, and and now um, we don't really buy anything. I mean, I don't buy compost anymore. I don't buy any organic inputs of any kind. I don't even buy calcium or limestone anymore. Um, and you know, when I, when the inspector comes along and, uh, this new inspector about two or three years ago, and she said, so, so where's your off farm inputs report? And I said, well, I don't have one. And she says, you have to have one, Nigel. I says, well, I don't have anything to write on one. And she didn't, <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she was like, no, Nigel, let's say we've organic farm buy stuff, you know, kind of a little bit, you know, come on, Nigel, then. Pull, try and pull that one on me. I said, well, let's go walk on the farm, you know? And so um, we did. And, and it, took a, it took a couple of hours of walking around the farm and showing her the crops and to, put, to convince her that I did not buy in anything that year. And uh, eventually she got it. Now, obviously, I think she, I think she had to change inspector this year or something, but uh, so I have to start the thing again. But um, eventually, <laughs> eventually she got it because that's very different to a lot of my contemporaries and to a lot of the corporate farms where basically you're, re you're replacing a bag of nitrogen uh, with a bag of palletized chicken manure. And so that is pretty much a lot of what organic is. Um, we've also found the real benefit of this is that we're growing bigger, better crops. So you would say, okay, so Nigel, what are you an idiot? You're, you're taking out a third of your land. You know, I take out, uh, got 60 acres in the vegetable rotation. I'm taking out 20 acres a year. You're losing 20 acres of crops. Well, as it turns out, is I'm now growing more on those 40 acres than I was on 60 acres with a lot more costs. So my farming this is, is something I'm hearing again and again from farmers, and especially folks that have been in it for a long time, is that, that following the land really pays. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's what saved me over the last four or five years. I mean, it's got pretty tight. And, um, you know, the fact that, um, I mean, one of my heroes, hey, uh, Gabe Brown uh, from the Dakotas, he farms 2,000 acres. Uh, he's a rancher. Uh, does these incredible cover crop mixes, which I, uh, I, I, I listen to Gabe and I learn a hell of a lot. And Gabe says, uh, he says, oh, I like to sign my name on the back of the check, not on the front of the check. <laughs> right? I, I have an adverse reaction to writing my name on the front. 
So, which I think is a pretty good thing for any farmer to, uh, uh, philosophy for any farmer is to, uh, you know, accept checks rather than send out checks. Um, so it's not to say, well, we're not saying we're making tons of money here, but we're not. But, um, you know, I think we are still solvent and still going in spite of many different things because we've managed to reduce the input costs on the farm. Is there anything else that you're doing for for your farm now that you're not? And I don't know what else it would be, but, you know, the idea that you're just doing a year of chicken, sheep and and pasture and then turning that into two years of vegetables. Where's the secret sauce? I mean, is this something that somebody <laughs> could just jump in on uh, right away or did it take time to get that system rolling? And and then I want to ask about the pesticides, too, because I'm a. I'm a little bit shocked that you're not spraying anything. Well, that's two issues there. What should we do? Well, let's stay with the pesticide, pesticide issues. So um, I want to get up in the morning uh, not thinking about what I'm going to kill that day. I would like to get up in the morning and like to feel, I mean, I know this sounds a little pedantic, a little uh, presumptuous or whatever, but you know, I, I really don't like getting up in the morning and thinking, okay, let's get, well, let's get the sprayer out, which is, you know, I mean, I've had some pretty big organic farmers come to visit and, you know, who admitted to me they're spraying every week. The problem with a lot of organic sprays is that they're not very specific. Um, and they tend to kill the good guys and, and the bad guys at the same time. So it's like this uh, addiction you get to. You know, you go through and you spray to kill the aphids or this bug or that bug, and you spray. You're know, also killing all the good guys and the good girls. Now, if you can, if you can, if you got the stomach for it, and it does take some stomach, and this has been a, a more recent um, benefit of the way we're farming. Um, if you are prepared to lose the occasional crop or write in your newsletter and saying, sorry, guys, uh, you know, the child's got a few holes in it this week, um, um, you know, and explain, then, um, then it works. Because I really believe that the chickens here, as the most incredible uh, cleanup crew a farm could ever have, I really believe they are making a huge difference. Uh, they, they're cleaning that pasture all these they eat stuff and i can't even see what they're eating right and they go crazy on right. some area and you know what they're eating it really does seem that we have a much lower level of pests now you know i've just this week's box had charred with holes in it um i had some dry beans that i lost to a cu uh, uh, cucumber beetle this year um, but i didn't lose all my beans uh, but it's not the end of the world um, I'm interested in producing really great diverse boxes for my members. And as long as I have enough diversity and as long as my customers are happy and keep entering in their credit card number, then, then we're good. Yeah. That is kind of the bottom line. Yeah. So that's how it's evolved. And I, I believe it's the result uh, of the whole picture. I mean, somebody to say go cold turkey on pesticides uh, of any kind it's not going to work. But if you treat the farm as a whole with your facility management, with your rotations, cover crops, leaving some areas, um, I mean, areas where the, they can live. I mean, I have windbreaks. I have Lombardy poplar windbreaks here and underneath them. I don't mow them. Um, you know, and they've been, been there for many, many years. And they're places for the good bugs uh, to live and to hide. I mean, underneath my orchard too, it's the same kind of deal. Like, as long as it's got a good crop on it, as long as there's enough fertility to, you know, produce a great tasting peach, uh, why should I do anything? Why should I mow underneath it? Um, you know, we need to get, uh, be able to get in there to pick it. So yes, we'll, we'll take a weed whacker every now and again and things like that. But why, why should I do anything? So to a lot of farmers, um, even some of my organic friends, friends, my farm is a little untidy, but it's deliberate. So, um, that's how I deal with that. Um, and it really does seem to work. Are the untidy areas confined? I mean, is it, is, oh, yeah. I mean, you've got, you've got weeds under the Lombardi poplars, but you don't have, do, at least I didn't see in the, in the pictures that I've seen in your farm. It's not like you've got weeds out in the fields. No, I mean, I have a, I have a, a finger weeder from Germany, 
which we imported from Germany. I've got a brush reader we have from Switzerland. Um, we have, we, we are very mechanized and we control, um, like even our, uh, with our, our squash and our corn plantings this year, we did the three sisters. So we did two rows on the bed of our winter squash. And in the middle row, we did, um, uh, corn and beans. And then our weed machine, uh, can lift up the, uh, drip lines. And then with finger weeders, weed, um, between the, the plants in the row. And then we have knives uh, that do between the rows. And it is pretty amazing when it goes through. So we, we have a fairly sophisticated uh, weed control. I mean, out of 17 people, have one guy who picks, uh, he's the papa. He's a, a couple of, uh, four of his sons work for me, Papa Ramon. And Ramon um, spends half the day picking fruit in the orchard that's ripe. And the other half of the day, hoeing. He's the only guy that hoes on the farm. Wow. One, one guy, half time. One guy, half time on 40 acres of vegetables. Um, now, if we really mess up, like if the irrigator and the guy doing the uh, finger weeding, uh, the cultivation, sort of get their uh, wires crossed and, um, and it's too wet to finger weed and we're too late, I mean, we, we have to, uh, set, you know, all the guys have to go out and clean up a particular area. Boy, did the, those guys hear about it from the rest of the crew. So <laughs> they don't like it. Uh, they don't like hoeing. Um, and they make that very clear. And even, uh, Ramon is, uh, my tractor driver and his father is the guy doing the hoeing. So he really hears about it. If, uh, if, uh, the <laughs> hoeing is the, if that's kind of the pressures I, on right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. I said, yeah, you know, if I look at an area, I say, Hey, your dad's not going to be happy. He said, no, he's already told me, <laughs> 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 you know, so, so yeah, so we pride ourselves in, controlling the weeds to a stage that they're not going to affect the final crop. So like in our onions, we, we obviously, when we first transplanted them, we really take care of them. Like, right, you know, a month before harvest, I'm not going to send in somebody to, to pull weeds that are going to have absolutely no effect on me, the final crop, right. you know? Um, I do have some weed problems. I do have Johnson grass that came in with the, uh, with our, um, uh, irrigation water sometimes. So that's one of my biggest challenges. So, you know, there are definitely some challenges there, but yeah, we keep the vegetables free of weeds as possibly as, you know, as much as we can, but you know, areas under trees, areas in, uh, by the side of roadways and areas, uh, like that, like that corners. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a scorched earth farmer, you know, mm. Uh, yeah. Roundup is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, around here, Roundup's used uh, like, uh, like uh, there was no tomorrow by many, many farmers. And it's, it's really, it's really, it's a bizarre environment for them. That's why we stick out so much. Nigel, I think pretty much everywhere in the country is a bizarre environment to be an organic vegetable farmer. I mean, it's just, <laughs> yeah. you know. If you really think about it, you're always going to stand out like a sore thumb. Right, right. Um, so, so talk to me about the fertility then on the farm, because this is something that I see when I go around to a lot of, especially beginning farmers, um, a lot of farms are kind of under fertilized. I mean, you, you know, you can see it, the plants just don't look that robust. And, and it's surprising to me to hear that you can have your land in a year of, of cover crop and chicken poop and turn that into, I think you said six crops now, three, three yeah. crops a year for two years of vegetables yeah. and, and be getting good quality, high yield vegetables off of there. Is there something else that you're, again, what's, what's the magic sauce here? Well, the magic sauce is, um, I think is education. Um, I mean, there are some incredible people out there. The, my, my real heroes, I mean, Elaine Ingham, the soil scientist. Uh, you've got Jill Clapperton. This is, there's like five or six of these ladies around the world who are just, I mean, you can listen to them on podcasts and on YouTube, and they talk a lot of sense about building fertility in your soil, providing the right environment for all the bacteria and fungi and all the soil life and all the benefits that that can bring a farmer. Now, it takes some study. It takes some time, but, you know, you guys in the Midwest, you got a lot of, got a lot of time in the winter compared to us. So, 
Um, you know, read, listen, all that kind of stuff. So that's a great education there about the science behind what we do. And then you've got the practical farmers like Gabe Brown. You've got Will Harris from uh, White Oak Pastures. Uh, two guys that are really doing this on a huge scale. Because some people say to me, oh, you know, Nigel, it's all right for you and your scale and, you know, sort of herb circles and that kind of stuff because I'm, I think I'm a small farm. Say, so, no, no, no. <laughs> I am learning from really big farmers. Sure, I've done my permaculture design course. I'm very much a permaculture kind of guy. Uh, a straight line permaculture guy. Um, but the real heroes and where I'm really learning a lot is from people on huge acreages. I mean, like Anna Savory, okay? I mean, <laughs> he is just incredible. And I have, hopefully, I, I try to listen and read everything that Alan says. And, you know, his stuff is based, a lot of his stuff, the way they, they do their um, grazing techniques is based on work by uh, Andre something, a French guy. And uh, his yeah, voice really, on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so, you know, Alan Savory has put 50 years into this, and he's right. I can unequivocally say, that Alan Savory is 100% right. And it works on my farm. Now, I don't have cows. Well, I do. I have a few house cows. But I have my, my, my big herd of buffalo is chickens, you know, or a mower. You know, I mean, I, I, my, you know, if I've got a cover crop that's at the right stage of growth and I, my chickens are at the wrong side of the farm or whatever, uh, my my buffalo is a is a flail mower, then we flail mower it down uh, to about three four inches off the ground, just as if the herd came through, and uh, you know, and then the plants will uh, give out the root exudates and the uh, all those good stuff that happens when when a crop is uh, given a uh, an impact either by the animal or by a mower. And you do that repeatedly, and you're flushing all these root all these exudates from the plants into the soil, you're, you're generating all this growth of uh, bacteria and fungi, and then you've got all the animal life, which then release the nutrients for the, for, for the crops. And we find that our fertility is building. So, so one year is a cover crop and pasture. The chickens come through, and obviously they poop on the ground. That's some fertility. And then we go, then we grow, uh, you know, after that, I might plant potatoes, I might plant you know, in the highest fertility year, I might plant potatoes and peppers and things like that with no other inputs. And then after that, I might put in cabbages and lettuces and things, and then maybe tomatoes in the last year, the second year, because, you know, I don't want the fertility to be too strong for those. That can be a problem too. And then you come back again and do it again, and the, the resulting, the year after that, you've got even more fertility. We actually... We, we, we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes here because the last couple of years we've had some broccoli harvests that have been too big to put in our CSA boxes. Because, <laughs> well, I, I, I know this sounds crazy, and I, I, I really, uh, at, the, at the risk of sounding as if I'm boasting, and I don't really, this is not what it's about. I'm being very serious here. On this soil, in our situation, with our rotation, we have been producing broccoli that is the size of a small dinner plate. Now, some our customer who lives in a in a tiny flat in San, uh, an apartment in San Francisco, paying five thousand dollars a month rent in a tiny fridge because they can't fit anything else in there, you give them a huge piece of broccoli like that, and uh, oh my god! And then they they cancel their box for the next week because they got too much. Right. Because they're working for Google and they've been uh, fed two meals a day at Google, you know. So, um, you know, we don't want we want nice regular sized broccoli and nice regular sized cabbages and cauliflower and nothing too big. And so, uh, we have this uh, the Chechi, the Chechi, the Chechi uh, transplanter from Italy. It's really nice. Yeah, to, yeah, really nice precision planter, uh, which costs a fortune. That's um, is uh, I believe is a very wise investment. Um, so we can quite accurately dial in differences in spacing. So two years ago, uh, Ramon, um, I said to Ramon, you know, we gotta we gotta tighten these things up because they're, they're too big. You know, we gotta plant things closer together. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. And, uh, 
And then last winter, we were harvesting the broccoli again. I said, Ramon, you didn't, you know, the, the, the fennel is like huge. And I said, Ramon, come on, you, 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 you didn't. He didn't time things up. He said, no, 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 I did. I did. I promise you I did. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you know, this is out of, after two, two sets of rotations. So, uh, wow. you know, this, 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 I, I'm, I'm very aware here. This, uh, this, this, this doesn't come across well, but I can tell you from my experience of 33 years of farming, uh, in many respects, using these fairly simple techniques, my farming has never been easier because uh, we cultivate some, we, we try and do so with as, as little cultivation as possible, but we cultivate by four or five inches with a sundown disc um, because we have flat ground and we can do it. And then we, we're rolling, irrigating, cultivating with a disc. And then we make a bed shaper to get a really flat bed. But, you know, we're really only going down four or five inches and so trying not to just disturb as little soil as possible and then transplanting right. into that. So, um, you know, we, we, cultivate, we mow the previous crop and we, we uh, disc and we irrigate and we roll and we make beds and we plant the next crop and again and again and again. We just keep transplanting or, or sowing seeds and... Uh, I don't have to, I mean, I used to have done this all before, you know. Okay, so I'm going to put peppers in a piece of ground. Okay, so that means I need to put a double or triple dose of compost. I need to put some feather meal down. I want the crops down. I've got the drip. I've got to uh, pump in some fish emulsion, and then I've got to pump in some calcium for blossom end rot. Uh, you know, all this kind of thing you've got to do and, and, and watch your crop. Any deficiencies or anything, I don't do that anymore. We just make the beds for the peppers just like any other crop and put them in the ground and they stay green. And we get a great crop. It's really amazing. I said this before, but a lot of the farms that I've worked with recently who are who are really crushing it are relying much more on systems that are about doing what would you call it? It's almost like doing the farming ahead of time. I mean, you you taking the ground out of production, putting it into putting it into the cover crops, managing those intensively and intentionally, and and then following on with that, with crops and, and weed control that actually works. And, and it's almost like the, it almost like it, well, it's what you said. It makes farming easier, not harder. Yeah. And it's a whole system. I mean, it's not treating in any crop individually. It's like saying, okay, here, if I, if I grow a good soil, I can forget about the vegetables. I really can. I can forget about them. I don't have to worry that my, you know, my peppers have enough nitrogen. And uh, it's a bizarre thing because, you know, I was, I, I was, I, I, I did the, I did the proper route, route you know, I was, I went to college, <laughs> you know, I have the proper, right. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, apply so many units of nitrogen, whether it be organic or not, and, and uh, apply these pesticides, organic or, you know, but yeah, it's like, um, yeah, but then let's not, I, I'm very simple. I probably have been too simplistic about our cover crop yet. I mean, we put a lot of effort into, we make beds just, just like we would for vegetables for our cover crop. We take that same care. Then I have all these different mixes and I've been experimenting over the last six years with different mixes of, um, rye grasses and clovers and, um, uh, all, all different things. And now it's just basically after, you know, what a lot of, of Gabe Brown and his contemporaries, um, I've learned from them is the diversity is very important. Um, and so that's something every farmer will have to seek out in their own location. You know, and also what are you looking for? You're looking for good organic matter. You're looking for some fertility to, you know, a crop to soak up nitrogen you have left at the end of the year, or you're looking to fix nitrogen and how does your climate, what, what crop, what cover crops does your climate allow you to have? And so having a good, having a good, seedsman who understands cover crops you know if you call up and say i want to buy some cover crop seed and say well what are your uh, what are you trying to achieve what are your limiting factors you know then that's the guy to buy a cover crop seed from because he understands 
what cover crops do and what they don't do. Basically, on my iPhone, I'm, I'm watching all my crops, taking lots of pictures, and then making notes because I would like to actually have a, a, you know, develop a mix that is going to be good all year round. So I just sow it once and, you know, it's going to give me some nice cover to protect the soil in the winter. And then in the spring, there's going to be other things that take over. And then in the heat of the summer, you know, something else that's going to take over. And um, uh, then when I come to break up that field and the chickens come to sort of murder the cover crop before we plant for the winter, we've still got a great cover crop there, uh, which keeps them happy and uh, keeps the soil covered all the time. So talk to me about a little bit about irrigation there in the, in the central Valley. And, uh, I, I read that you actually studied drip irrigation in Israel, which I think is where drip irrigation got its start. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Because the uh, Palestinians were shooting at the uh, kibbutzniks and so they needed uh, ways to irrigate their crops and control the valves uh, without being out in the field all the time. Um, yeah. So there's a real limiting, I mean, if you waste water, in California, you know, you're a wasteful person. In in Israel, it's treason, you know. You can't waste water as a farmer. Um, they're so far ahead of us in terms of drip irrigation. I mean, I was there in, what, 86, 87? Um, and, you know, it was incredible the, what they were doing with drip irrigation and the equipment, huge rolls that fitted on um, machines to grow uh, the farm. I was on, they were growing organic cotton. And they were just set up for it, you know. It wasn't, you know, nobody was walking along winding drip tape around their arm. It was like huge rolls of drip tape that they were, and drip tubing that they used. So uh, I learned a lot there. I mean, one one guy I worked for uh, kind of had a CSA back in those days. And uh, so he'd supply uh, customers in Tel Aviv and uh, the surrounding area and uh, now we had a barn and in the barn there was this sort of cupboard and uh, I said what's in your cupboard and he said and he opened it up and there was this irrigation controller very sophisticated irrigation controller like nothing I'd ever seen before and so he could um, he had valves popping up all the way through his fields um, that were controlled from this controller and um, you know he'd be irrigating a lot at night um, and um, did an incredible job. I mean, it's, um, it was a, a heavy investment, um, but he didn't have a choice because he had only a limited amount of water, and his water dictated basically how much crops he grow, or how much and how, how different crops. So um, that was a good, good. You know, that's. I think that's what really. Um, dinned it into me. And so I got a pretty thick skull. Sometimes it takes a few times to learn or something. And um, um, that I really picked that one up. And that's when when bought this farm is to really make sure that we had a really good, reliable source of water. So um, Yeah, and that's certainly paying off now. Are, are you doing all of your irrigation with drip? No, no, because um, I, in, in there, there are, Drip is not appropriate in some circumstances. So right. let's let's take a crop of tomatoes. So um, you transplant the crop, and you want those root, young roots to explore as much soil as possible, because that's where all those different nutrients are. Now, if you're doing if you're doing chemical fertilizers on those uh, tomatoes, you, the soil is just a medium to stand the crop up in, and you're just drip feeding it with chemicals, right? So you can put drip in from day one, right? Right, but an organic farm, and you have to really build a beautiful, uh, wide, big, as big root system as possible. Get that crop established so that it can fruit well. So what we tend to do is we will uh, sprinkle irrigate that crop, um, and then um, at a point where we really can't get in there to cultivate anymore, we will then come in and uh, lay drip lines on the surface, and uh, then. That that goes for quite a few crops, except so obviously the winter crops, cabbages and things like that. We we start them with sprinklers, and then they get fed with rain or more sprinklers if it doesn't really get if it, the rain doesn't come. You know, and so that's pretty much what we do. We do sprinklers and drip. That's a really it's a, a great suggestion about the tomatoes. I really like that uh, an idea of getting those roots to really spread out. And I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier about it being a whole system. Yeah. 
you know, it's, it's everything working together and really thinking about the fact that you're growing organic tomatoes in an environment where, <laughs> where you're not going to put down additional fertility for them. Yeah, they can, they've, they've, they've only got where the roots can reach, you know, so, you know, you want a biologically active soil. And um, you really do. I mean, this is a serious thing. I mean, when you listen to Elaine Ingham and all, her, all those fantastic ladies, um, it is absolutely crucial. But it's not difficult. And I, I think, um, while I say we're not, you know, we're not buying infertility, I don't. I think we're about twenty percent down that road. I really do believe we've got a long way to go. Um, to before I can honestly uh, sit here and say I have a biologically active soil because there's a really yes seriously I mean I I've got to that stage where I've got a uh, uh, you know the soils the soil there's a lot of life in the soil but I think it's too uh, bacteria oriented rather than fungi I've still got weeds and I'm still cultivating. The 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 nirvana or the uh, the real uh, the 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 uh, the, the, the part of gold at the end of the rainbow um, is to have a low growing permanent cover crop with huge diversity in it that you keep uh, mowed down with with animals or a mower you then plant in your crop uh, by cultivating a slight uh, strip or or a no-till drill, your crop grows fast. Um, your cover crop, your low, very low-growing cover crop, meaning one or two or three inches tall, uh, grows underneath the crop. You harvest your crop, and then you send in uh, animals or bower to consume what is left, and then you replant. And the low-growing cover crop uh, will be will have an incredible root system, um, you will have mycorrhiza fauna, all, all of it will all be interconnected. The roots will reach down 15, 20 feet in the soil, bringing up really deep moisture, providing stability. You'll be able to go in on the field in wet weather without damaging it. Um, that is the, that is the pot of gold. That is, that is, that is where we're going. And I think we're 20% down that road. Have you tried any any standing cover crops that you've simply planted vegetables into? No, I tried some low growing uh, pollinator mixes this year, but they really just they grow too tall. Um, and Elaine Ingham has this list of um, all these different um, plants that would she should suggest that they might be useful. But you know, trying to get seed of some of these things is really really difficult. Uh, so that's one of the stumbling blocks we have is we need some research into, you know, a, a, you know, to, to really look through all these different plants that are in, in the native plants and all from, you know, what, what, all the resources that we have on different plants and see which ones will grow. Um, because also let's say you put in, uh, a low growing cover crop mix of 15 or 20 things. You know, the winter might be cold and wet. So, you know, the next summer, you know, some of them, you know, three or four of them grow. Then the summer might be quite cool and different ones will grow. So you need the huge diversity to give you that um, uh, coverage over the years. Um, and so there's so much work to be done there. And then we're only just even just scratching the surface of that. But that is our goal here is to really eliminate cultivation and just basically have the tractor go through with a no-till drill or a strip tiller and the transplanter coming behind and then have a whole diversity of animals behind it because you know you talk about diversity of cover crop i mean we want loads of different root exudates I, the party underneath the ground has to have a smorgasbord of food otherwise you know just to give it like vetch or ryegrass Okay, that's okay, but you know you can't live on sugar alone or burgers alone. So the more diversity of food that you can give the soil life, the better. And then also the more diversity of animals on top gives you more. Again, that that sort of multi, it's a multiplier. Um, and so that is critical too. So all of that together 
um, is where the uh, is, is that I'm not sure that's an end point, but that's a goal uh, that uh, seems like a long, long way away at the moment. But we're, 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 it's a journey. <laughs> not, well, like I, and Nigel, I think you're you're the. I mean, you clearly aren't intimidated by those sorts of genetic journeys. I mean, you've you're in the middle of this project with the the chicken breeding to be right. able to develop your own genetics on the farm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's kind of the same as what we've been doing with our heirloom tomatoes. I mean, basically, you're acclimatizing a crop or a chicken to the farm. So, you know, uh, we, we got these chickens, uh, we're part of the uh, Sustainable Poultry Network, and so we, uh, Jim Atkins has had that, and uh, so he convinced me that uh, I could do that, and I said, okay, let's do it. And so you take a bunch of chickens from a breeder, uh, really the best of the best. You bring them on your farm and you see which ones thrive. Um, You know, ours came from North Carolina and you put them in a California environment, you raise them up and you say, okay, you know, this male and this male and this male did really well and the other 97 didn't do well. So they go to slaughter. and you keep the really good ones and the females. Uh, you know, we ended up keeping half the females. And so we divided them up into three families and the best male goes with the best females. And then we, you know, we trap nest them as well and record, um, you know, who uh, who's laying the best, most eggs. And we have uh, our incubators and we're, we're raising about 130 chicks a week. And so... And these are the best of the best. And then uh, the females go into the laying crop and, uh, and, uh, and the males go on ice at about 17, um, 18 weeks old. And so that's been, we've been selling those to our members. It started, started a little slow um, in terms of sales because, you know, they, they're expensive to raise. So there's definitely some price pushback. But it's, people are really tasting the chicken. We use black ostrich lots. Um, so that's, it's, it's, it's a real simple thing. I mean, just think about it. You know, what I need is I need to totally select each year the best of the best. And in that way, I'm acclimatizing the chickens that really like this climate. They really like the food regime. They really like being at Eat Wild Farm. And the ones that don't like it go, you know? Right. And then the, the same thing happens the next year, you know? And so... Uh, we're hoping to make 5% improvement a year for five years, and that'll be significant improvement. But then you take these chickens, I like to say you take them, you know, a thousand, a thousand or 800 miles north, um, up into Washington, and maybe they don't do so well, and you have different ones that thrive. But that's the great thing. You're, you know, you're not saying, oh, the black ostrilop is the best chicken. Well, it might, you know, my strain of black ostrilop does well in my situation because I've selected it for it. But that's not necessarily the same strain as what works in, uh, or the same breed that works in Tucson or in, or in, um, you know, in uh, Madison, you know, Wisconsin. So right. it's understanding that. I mean, Joel Salat talks about this. It's like you select and breed for for, for animals that do well in your particular climate and you don't get necessarily so fixated on, you know, the red Devon is the best uh, cow in the world, that kind of thing, you know, because, you know, we're in the business of um, producing uh, food for people at the best possible price and doing the best possible job we can. So that's one of the ways that farmers have always done it for uh, many thousands of years. Hey, Nigel, we're going to take a break here and get a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost. Carl Hammer, the founder and the owner of the company, likes to describe potting soil as a set of promises, a promise that it has the nutrients the plant needs, that it has the microbes the plant needs to help forage those nutrients, and that it's free of weed seeds. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew some great transplants with it year after year in soil blocks and in traditional cell flats. We even grew rosemary plants in pots for multiple years, a real testament to the 
the structure of the soil, which can keep the microbes alive over an extended period of time and provide good aeration for the roots on an ongoing basis. When you put plants in containers, whether it's a five-year-old rosemary in a 20-gallon nursery can or a 24-day-old lettuce seedling in a 1020 cell tray, you need an optimized matrix of materials that can produce a healthy plant within a restricted media volume. Vermont Compost Potting Soils provide just that consistently year after year. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmigo CSA Management Software, providing the tools you need to manage your CSA business. Farmigo CSA Management Software is designed from the ground up to manage the CSA you operate from customer sign-up right through delivery. Farmigo staff will work with you to customize the dashboard for your farm based on the way your CSA works. System setup is free, and the system can be configured for a wide variety of CSA models, from the traditional box plan right through fully modifiable boxes. On the customer side, Farmigo offers a portal for members to sign up, make payments, and access their account to manage vacation holds and site changes, all with the control by the farm over what can be changed and when the changes can be made. On the farmer side, you can send fully customizable confirmation emails and auto responses and generate reports to help you manage everything from harvest and loading the truck right through delivering the CSA shares. And they offer amazing customer support to you at no charge. They'll even call you if you need help. Learn more at csamanagementsoftware.com. So could you tell us a little bit about how your CSA program works? Um, You mentioned, and, and this doesn't this doesn't feel like CSA to me when you when you say that you send too much broccoli to somebody and they cancel their box for the next week. That's that's right. a model that I guess I'm not that familiar with. <laughs> right. That's a, you know we we do CSA a little differently in California. I mean that's not to say that there aren't some uh, uh, Midwest and East Coast models that operate quite successfully here. We have a we have a customer base that is uh, traveling a lot. Um, that is. Um, uh, Oh, it's it, there. There's families and, and such like. I mean, somebody might email me, or now they go onto the website and do it themselves with their with their schedule for the next three months. You know, and they might be a month in Germany, they might be back for two months, and they might be another trip. And so, you know, they, you know, I would lose a lot of customers if I said you have to sign up for a year, you have to pay me for a year, because so many things can change. You know, we got a lot of people in the tech industry who who don't necessarily know where they're going to be working in three months' time, you know, because they, they choose to move around a lot. Um, right. You know, they move campuses too, so maybe they can't pick up their box at one particular location. So what we do is we sell um, uh, boxes in batches of four, 13, and 26. So, you know, somebody's going to... Uh, Sign up. They're going to pay for four boxes, which is um, uh, they're twenty nine dollars each, and they can get them every week or every other week. If they're going out of town, they can go online to uh, we use uh, local harvest uh, service uh, CSA Ware as our online database, so they're able to go online and put their box on hold, or they can donate it if they'd like to, because uh, we do. Uh, uh, we have ten subscriptions for uh, cancer patients that are free. Um, so, um, you know, we offer that flexibility, uh, you know, it, it's a model that has worked very well for us. Um, you know, it used to be that 85% of my members got a box every week and now it's pretty much 85% of my members get a box every other week. So that means that our weekly numbers have taken a really big hit and we're not alone in that. Um, that's pretty typical of. Uh, CSA farmers, uh, their numbers of boxes each week has, has fallen quite dramatically over the last three or four years. So um, I believe that's to uh, changing of demographics for people who can afford to live in the Bay Area. Um, and also a lot of our, our customers, they get fed two or even three meals a day at work. Right. Um, and also organic, mm-hmm. organic is so much more available now. And almost every store around here has an organic section. And, uh, you know, a lot, I'm, I'm really not selling that much to stores because it's a lot of stuff is coming up really cheap from Mexico and certified organic, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, like my crew says, uh, you know, what, what I pay them in an hour, they get paid a day in Mexico and there's no workers' compensation. There's no safety training. There's none of this stuff here. 
So uh, that's that's what I'm really saying is why it's become very competitive uh, the last four or five years. It's it's not been easy to uh, make the numbers work at the end of the year. Um, you know, we we've got a very loyal customer base, so we're not going anywhere. Um, but still, um, you know. Uh, money is energy to do things and to make changes on the farm. I need, I need money. It oils the wheels. I was uh, a very wise person once took me to one side a long, long time ago. And she said, you know, you've got to have the right attitude to business, to money and business. You know, said that money is energy and you need that energy to do everything you need to do for your business. And so that was, that's really helped me. Um, sometimes when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning, worrying about money, um, it's sort of helped me uh, deal with those issues. And so, yeah, so it, it does dictate. I mean, like for the chicken enterprise where we had to, you know, buy incubators, pay for our consultant, pay for the chicks, all the kind of stuff, it was 20,000 bucks. And, you know, members wanted me to not buy chicks from these hatcheries where they kill the males, you know? And so I said for a long time, I said, well, this is, I'm not sure I can do this. I, I, you know, and then we met uh, Jim Atkins on the Sustainable Poultry Network. And so we figured out a way and Jim walked us through the whole process. But I said to my members, but I can't, I can't do this. I don't have 20,000 bucks kicking around. Um, I need your help. And they, they, they absolutely came up to the plate and um, we were able to do it. Now it's cost a lot more than 20,000 dollars but that initial you know buying all those incubators and uh, setting the whole thing up that's great that your members were willing to step up and and meet you there yep absolutely um it's been yeah i mean that's that's the other so i you know i said that the greatest thrill was uh, the crew but um uh i i have had some pretty poignant moments uh, over these uh so I started farming here in 93, and the, some of the members have been with me since the beginning, either buying from us at the farmer's market. And uh, I was, uh, a couple, few years ago, I was in hospital at uh, UCSF, you know, and um, uh, in San Francisco, a great uh, teaching hospital, a fantastic care. And uh, a lady came into the, my room. She said, uh, I'm your physical therapist. You know, my name is so and so. And she said, uh, I've been a member of your farm for the last 10 years and you've fed my children. And now it's my turn to take care of you. And, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, that community is incredible. Um, the help that I've been given, our family's been given, uh, is, uh, yeah, that's I, I work for my crew, but I also work for the community because when that when they send that money in, it's not my money, right? It's the farm's, right. Money. It's the farm's money. I do the best I can with people's hard earned money. And, you know, I take very little out of the business, you know, obviously, you know, medical expenses and, uh, you know, all what we need to, you know, family expenses and things like that. But, you know, I have the. I have the junkiest car on the farm. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is a passion. This is a disease. And I'm a very lucky guy that, uh, my wife uh, totally agrees with me. Um, she's passionate about the farm. Uh, she loves cooking. So, uh, it was amazing. I, I finally found the, as my mother would say, finally found a woman, uh, the right, the, the right woman. Um, and, uh, Lorraine, uh, loves to cook and I love to grow things. So the deal we have is uh, I grow it, she cooks it. Now, the best deal I've ever done in my whole life, I tell you. <laughs> you know? That's great. I like that. Yeah. That's really great. So it comes down to people. It comes down to people and relationships. You know? And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I'm a very, very lucky guy. Thank you, Nigel. So um, at the end of our shows, we do like to do a lightning round. A few quick questions for you here just to, to get okay. down to some nuts and bolts stuff. Um, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Uh, the finger weeder. So tell me about a finger weeder. Yeah. 
Well, it's um, if you go onto YouTube and uh, type in Eat Well Farm, you'll see uh, some videos of, uh, uh, or even type my name in, Nigel Walker, or Finger Weeder. Um, you'll see it's uh, uh, two circles of fingers. They're rubber fingers or I guess plastic rubber or whatever. And basically they're disturbing the soil underneath the plants. So we'll transplant, let's say, a cabbage uh, 10 days later, seven, eight days later. Uh, you know, the weeds are just starting to emerge. Uh, you go in and you disturb the soil and those weeds are gone. Um, and then you keep doing that uh, every four to five days. You know, like after that, we'll, we'll, we'll irrigate. As soon as it's dry enough, we go in again. As soon as it's dry enough, we go in again. I mean, the best time to use a finger eater is when you can't see any weeds. And in that way, we can, we can completely um, control the weeds in a crop, a transplanted crop, without taking the hoe into the field. Like cabbages, cauliflower, uh, um, uh, fennel, you know, things like that. It's, um, and the, really the time when we take the hoe in is like, oh, we mess up all, all of us. And you, you know, a pipe leaks or a pipe bursts and it's too wet and all that kind of stuff. Those things do happen. So that's why I love that machine. Right. Yeah. Fantastic machine. And uh, somebody was asking me the other day, I had some young farmers visit uh, from the uh, farm academy uh, near us. And uh, this is, well, you know, $14,000, Nigel, that's a lot of money. And I said, uh, I will stand here and say that that pays me back every three months in saved labor. Just on the weeding alone? Yes. Yeah. On 40,000. Yeah. 4,000. Oh, sorry, on 40 acres of vegetables. Yeah, it pays me back four times a year. Because you see, we're not hoeing in between the, the, the cabbages by hand. I mean, I know people can hill and all this kind of stuff, and that, but you know that takes some precision. Um, you know, this is this is easy and fantastic. Great. We'll make sure that we find that video and and get a link up to that on the show notes page. All right. And uh, your favorite crop to grow? Oh, that's a tricky one because we grow. I grow, always say we grow too many things. If I'm asked how much we grow. Uh, you know, I can't answer that. I can't on, honestly answer that. I mean, I, I scrambled I scrambled through the earth in the first week of May this year because we plant potatoes in um, late late uh, January, early February. And I scrambled and I got a, a, a handful of new potatoes off two or three plants. And I brought them inside and the rain cooked them up and we had them with butter. And they were mind-blowing. You know, um, yeah, potatoes. I mean, the first tomatoes. Well, first tomatoes of the year aren't always the best, but we have some incredible melons. I mean, you know, I mean, there's so many great things to eat. I mean, I, I don't. That, that's a, a memory I have. I don't. I don't. Um, you know, there's so many great things. Great peaches. I worked on a peach farm in Santa Barbara, and it's it's. Uh, I've I've regretted for 20 years having left that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and flavor is such a um, such a uh, it takes you back. I had one lady call me about seven o'clock in the evening. This was a good few years ago, but she called me back. She was crying, and I picked up the phone and said, "You know, is everything okay? Was your box okay?" And she said, "And eventually, she calmed down, and she said she'd taken the potatoes." And uh, she just boiled them up and just had a plate full of potatoes and butter because that's really, she was just so tired from work. And she looked into the first potato and knew the butter on it. And she said she was immediately transported back to her grandfather's garden. She could smell him. She could just the whole thing. She was just, she was transported. And she burst into tears because she all these fantastic memories of being in her grandfather's garden came back. And I mean, what more of a, I mean, that to me, what more of a compliment could anybody pay you as a farmer than something like that? And, um, you know, when members say that, or this is the best chicken I've ever had, or these are the best eggs I've ever had, that's, that's rewarding enough. 
And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing before you got started in this whole business, what would it be? Um, to think permaculture from a very early stage, because that's where we're going. We're actually doing a lot of alley cropping. You know, I mean, you know that guy, Mark Shepard, you must know him. Yeah. Right. I know Mark. Not right. <laughs> uh, he sort of, I, I learned about permaculture um, back in the late 80s, and I read the big, thick book a couple of times and tried to figure out how, how the hell can I make this work on my sort of vegetable farming on a fairly large scale, and I couldn't figure it out. And then I went to uh, uh, one of Mark's two-day courses when his book first came out in Kentucky, at the Acres USA conference. And, you know, it's like, oh, you stupid idiot, Nigel. Of course you can, this is how you do it. This is how you take the principles of permaculture and you do it on a larger scale. You know, we take straight lines, permaculture, you know, always got hooked on this curved thing. And, um, you know, of course I'm farming straight lines. And so that's what we're doing now. We're doing alley cropping. A couple of lines of trees with herbs on between the rows, and um, and then we're doing uh, eighteen uh, beds of vegetables, and then another two lines of fruit trees, and then we've got our windbreaks with fruit trees either side, and we're coppicing our windbreaks and things like that. So that's what we're setting up at the moment. That's when the time and the money allows. We're working our way through the farm. And so um, that's what I, I would have, if I'd have done that a long time ago, I'd be much further down the road than I am now. I just love how clear it is that you're, you're working uh, wherever you can on your farm to create the best possible farm. I just think that's, I think it's fantastic. All of the, all the little corners that you're exploring and all the ways in which you, you, you're not sitting back on your heels, but continuing to really push forward, not just in terms of, of producing great vegetables, but also making the whole farm work? Well, I think you, you, it's more of a question of the low hanging fruit. You know, what is easy to achieve now? Don't get too bent out of shape by, you know, oh, there's this thing that I want to eliminate or do, but it's too expensive and I don't have the time. Well, let's see what's low hanging fruit. And maybe you've got three or four things going at the same time. So, you know, there's some people that's like, they like to finish a project before they start another project. Oh, it drives me crazy. You know, we do what we can when we can um, with the time that we have and the money that we have. And we'll have three or four different projects going. And, you know, today might be the appropriate to do a bit of work on Project A. Tomorrow might be a good time to do something on Project B. And so that can drive some people absolutely crazy. Uh, but it's never something, uh, you know, one person did actually say to me once that I wasn't encumbered by detail. <laughs> you know, that's that's a that's a backhanded compliment if I've ever heard one. Yeah, but I think uh, you know, um, you know, well, one of my friends uh, farms apples in England, and he says that he wants his crew to do a ninety percent job. Absolutely, this is a great guy. He grows fantastic apples, but the, the thing he said is, look, if I want every apple tree to be pruned perfectly. If I want everything to be done perfectly on the farm, it costs too much money, you know? And so right. if I can train somebody to uh, do a work accurately, swiftly, and do a 90% job, the benefit, the cost benefit is so much greater. Um, now, we, we grade hard because we feed, we, uh, we feed all our grade, you know, our grade two vegetables, uh, to our chickens. So, I mean, we're sending out beautiful produce, but in terms of growing them, you know, um, I'm not trying to have absolutely perfect crops. I, we need to get that crop in the ground. We need to get the next crop in the ground. We need to, uh, you know, take the finger weed it through that. We need to tie up tomatoes. I want a 90% job, not a hundred percent job. Um, that's hard for a lot of farmers. Well, I think it's such an express, it's so much, so often your farm is such an expression of you as a farmer. It's, it's, you know, and so any, any imperfection, I think so many people see it as a reflection, uh, a personal reflection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You should see my tool shed. Um, yeah. That's, that's reflection on me. 
it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. But I think in terms of uh, a very serious point is that, um, you know, if you're trying to do every single thing perfectly, uh, I would say you have a hard time surviving financially. Yeah, I think the trick is figuring out which, you know, which things to give on and, and where that 90% really is. And that only comes with experience. Yeah, that would be the hard thing for your beginning farmer self, uh, yeah. I think. So, yeah. all right, Nigel, thank you for a, a really great interview. This has been fantastic. I feel like there's just a, a ton of value in here for the people to take away. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me tonight. Well, thank you for asking me. And, um, you know, I've been slowed down a lot recently and, um, you know, I do, you know, I think experience is something that uh, is very difficult to teach. And uh, so I, I'm, I, like I say, we had a group of young farmers here a couple of weeks ago, and I, I take it, take the touring with them every year very, very seriously because there's a lot of things that you can only gain by uh, bitter experience, you know. So thank you very much for asking me. Thanks, Nigel. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 33 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and that you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Walker. That's W-A-L-K-E-R. If you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for harvesting winter squash. You can sign up at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. If you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. It's worth noting that the show does take a substantial amount of time and energy and, you know, time is money to produce. Our sponsors like Vermont Compost and Farmigo CSA Management Software for this episode and Fertrell, Osborne Seed Company, Second Cup Media, and Audible for previous shows really support this work. Accessing their web pages through the show notes page and sponsorship page on my website provides them with a way to measure your engagement. And of course, so does mentioning that you hear their ad on the Farmer to Farmer podcast when you talk to them over the phone. You know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things, but I know that I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit the farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear from on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.